morning and welcome to Worship with Ebenezer. My name is Chris Becklin and I am the corporate chaplain for Ebenezer. And if you're joining in today, it means that you're likely one of our Ebenezer family sites. We have over a hundred that make up our Ebenezer family, all the way from Grand Marais in the north to Des Moines, Iowa in the south, and now River Falls, Wisconsin in the east. So welcome to worship today. Our opening hymn today is Softly and Tenderly. Please join us as we sing together, Softly and Tenderly. of October as we remember St. Francis of Assisi and join in that celebration. Our prayer today is the litany of St. Francis. Please join us with the bold portion of this litany. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Merciful Lord God, constant source of all healing, we give you thanks for all your gifts of strength and life. And above all, we thank you for the gift of your Son, through whom we have health and salvation. As we wait for the day when there will be no more pain, help us by your Holy Spirit to be assured of your power in our lives and to trust in your eternal love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our gospel today for this 21st week after Pentecost comes from the book of Luke, the 18th chapter. Now, Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, 
would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Here ends our gospel. Will you join with me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be ever acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. How many times have we heard this passage or this type of passage? And the Bible, especially the Gospels, in which we hear the words of Jesus and the stories of Jesus, we hear this example over and over and over again. It's called the great reversal in things that we think are important, wealth and status are really in the minds of Jesus, in the example of Jesus, not the important part. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. All who humble themselves, however, will be exalted. And these kind of passages uh, hit quite close to home. And I think a lot of us, uh, especially those of us who clergy, when we hear some of these things, I'm more like the Pharisee. <laughs> I pray, I fast, I give money away. I'm a good person. I am the Pharisee in this conversation today. And by that, I mean I am the one that has to be very careful about how I walk in my life of faith. Part of the question is, is how do I make sure that I'm humble enough? How do I make sure that I don't exalt myself in my faithfulness, in my goodness, in my pastorness? How do I make sure that all of these things that I'm doing in my life of faith and that we have done all these years in Sunday school, theology, theological training, all of my training as a minister, puts me in the exact same place as the Pharisee. How do I keep from looking at someone else with contempt? And how do I ensure that I remain a certain amount of humility so that I don't get called out in this lesson like Jesus does? I am the Pharisee, or I have the danger of becoming the Pharisee. I have no worry about becoming the tax collector. I don't work for the IRS. I'm a minister. And the Pharisees are my closest brothers and sisters in this conversation. I don't have to worry about being too humble. I have to worry about being exalted and thinking that I'm better than others because I can read Greek, because I know the hymnody, because I can say the Lord's Prayer from memory, because I lead worship. Sounds a lot like the Pharisee in our lesson today, doesn't it? So how do we do that? How do we keep from having contempt for our brothers and sisters? How do we, as in the language of Jesus, how do we choose the lower seat? How do we choose that humility so that we can maybe avoid being this in exalted status that the lesson is so clearly worried about. And Jesus is inviting us to reflect on. Chris, how do you keep humility? How do you be careful about being exalted and so important? How do you follow a little bit more the spirit of the tax collector? who doesn't feel worthy in the midst of this conversation. How do we do that? I don't know. And I've spent a lot of my life trying to figure that out. 
and probably you have as well. And I watch very closely uh, other parts of our Christian world. And one of the places where I think about this is, is how we work and the kinds of things that we do. And whether uh, doing things that are so-called demeaning might be helpful in our lives of faith. I love reading about the monasteries and the old monks and the history of monasticism. And one of the stories that always comes out and reminds me when these texts comes up is the leader of a monastery is known as an abbot or an abbess if it's a monastery of women. And one of the monasteries that I love to read about, one of their rules that they followed is that everybody in the monastery had to scrub floors. Everyone. Now, you might remember, those of you who are in the military, all of these shows of scrubbing the floors with your toothbrush. And part of that was to encourage discipline, but it was also to encourage humility, to take the lower seat. And I love this one monastery. They insisted that every monk, including the abbot, scrubbed floors. They wanted everyone in the monastery, from the youngest monk to the oldest monk, from the least important monk to the most educated, to scrub floors. Why? Maybe they had a lot of floors to scrub. <laughs> or maybe there was a belief that this lowest of jobs, being the janitor, scrubbing the floors, cleaning toilets, to make sure that all of that work was not beneath those that were supposedly exalted. Everybody did it. Everybody scrubbed the floors. Everybody cleaned the toilets. Everybody washed the dishes. No work was demeaning. And the highest so-called, maybe to remind themselves of their humility, their humanity, their collegiality with the tax collector. All of them scrubbed the floors. All of them washed dishes. All of them cleaned the toilets as an act of faith, as one way to remind those of us who have education, who have status, who have great faith, as I like to think of myself sometimes to remind us that in the very core is our humanity. And everybody mops the floor. Everybody washes the dishes. And everybody scrubs the toilets. I think of that because in my own family, and I wonder if you think of your own family, look at all the people in your family and all the jobs that they have had. And I love to do that, especially with my kids, because... My grandmother was a house cleaner, and so was my aunt. My mom was a cook and used to be a hairdresser. My grandpa was an auto mechanic back in the day when it wasn't such a great thing to do. I have generations of farmers. One of my family members is a plumber. I have a brother-in-law who's a cable installer. And one works in a water treatment plant. All good work, all good jobs, none of them are a pastor. And I might think, well, pastor, I went to college, I went to seminary, I pray for a living. And if I take the advice of the abbot, I maybe should work in the water treatment plant for a while. I should maybe clean houses. In fact, I've begun to wonder, maybe when I retire, maybe as a sign of humility, I should go back to being a house cleaner, like my grandma and my aunt. And maybe to do it for someone in need. You see, it's not just the act of doing something that is beneath you, or so-called beneath you. It is also doing it for another. 
You see, someone has to clean the floors. Someone makes the food. Someone has to clean the streets. And it is that sense of shared humanity. And for some of us, for a lot of us, especially those that have had professional lives and worked and education, the challenge might be greater. I think of this when I'm raising my own kids who I don't want to have as hard a life as I did. I cleaned a lot of toilets to get my way through college. I worked for seven summers as a janitor. And one example, I thought I was going to enjoy it to no end. But the one day I was handed a whole case of gritty cleanser of Comet and said, don't come back until it's gone. <laughs> Clean every toilet you can find. I had a far deeper appreciation of cleaning and cleaners and the importance of that work. I want my kids to have an easier life than I did. You probably wanted the same thing. And, and I want them to have the humility and gratitude that comes with it. I want my kids to be thankful for the gifts that they have been given and the humility to know that they are gifts and they are to be treasured, not to assume that I deserve them because of my exalted status. That's a tricky thing. How do you both give your children more than you got and engender in them gratitude and thankfulness and humility. Is it as simple as making sure that all of us do the work that everyone does? Maybe that's an advocacy for if we are going to have a military and if we are going to support a military as a country, then everybody needs to participate, not just the volunteers, everyone. Is it possible that I want my kids to not only have jobs that are easy, but ones that are hard as well. And I'm thankful that they work for Target and are with humanity all day long and that they make pizzas with Papa Murphy's and tie into the tradition of cooking in my family. And I was most glad last summer when they worked at a berry farm and as an organic farmer and came home filthy and dirty every day, and tired and exhausted. I want them to have that connection to all of humanity, that we all participate in this work. I don't know if this is really the way to do it. I love seeing that the abbot, on his hands and knees, scrubbing the floor, is that enough to help us have this sense of humility, this sense of gratitude, this sense of connection? You see, Jesus wants the Pharisee to be able to see himself and connected to the tax collector. I used to have a, a person I worked with who worked for the IRS, and I always loved visiting him because he carried so much shame for the job that he had to do. And I often found this connection of saying someone has to do that work. And if you can do with honesty and courage, don't we want the people that work for the IRS to have honesty and courage and not as much shame and guilt? I don't know that I'm going to sign on to be an IRS agent at some point in my life. I don't know if I'm going to clean houses when I enter retirement for those that are poor or needy. But it is first and foremost in my mind, how do I keep from becoming exalted? How do I embrace the humility that is invited and encouraged and suggested strongly by Jesus? You see, when I read the Bible, 
and I hear about the Pharisees, the temptation for a lot of us is to think, oh, the Pharisees, <laughs> the Sadducees, the priests, those people. Well, my friends, uh, I'm those people. And the challenge for me is the same challenge that Jesus offers to the Pharisee and the Sadducee and the priest. I'm thankful for my gift of faith. I'm thankful for my ministry. I'm thankful that I was called to be a pastor. But the task is much, much more difficult. My friend, the IRS agent, he has an easier time. He knows that he's not exalted in society. The challenge, my friend, is which are we closer to? Which are we wrestling with? And my burden, my cross, is finding ways to seek and encourage humility in myself, in my children, in the world around us. My friends, we all have to ask this question. What, what is it that will help us to follow the wisdom of Jesus and to be so at God's love and care and mercy and to be thankful for that every moment and every day of our lives? Amen. Please join us as we sing together our hymn of the day, Jesus Calls Us. Please join in singing, Jesus Calls Us. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our lives Wild, restless sea, day by day His sweet voice soundeth Saying, Christian, follow me Jesus calls Let us now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate and was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us pray for our friends, our family, our churches, and our world. And we'll be using the prayers that I often use during this month of October when we remember the example of St. Luke the Evangelist and Healer. And I invite you to respond with a bold portion as we remember the blessings all around us. Blessed be the hands that touch young lives, babies, toddlers, and preschoolers. Blessed be the hands that embrace others with compassion. Blessed be the hands that administer medicine, give aspirin, bandage wounds. Blessed be the hands that prepare meals. Blessed be the hands that wash dishes, clean floors, arrange flowers. 
Blessed be the hands that anoint the sick and offer blessings. Blessed be the hands that grow stiff with age. Blessed be the hands that comfort the dying and have held the dead. Blessed be the hands that capture a memory in art and poetry and song. Blessed be the hands that guide the young. Blessed be the hands that greet strangers. Blessed be the hands that learn the way of justice. Blessed be the hands that fill out applications, write papers, carry books, send emails. Blessed be the hands that receive and sort information, and hands that determine budgets. Blessed be the hands, for we hold the future in these hands. Blessed be our hands. For they are the work of your hands, O Holy One. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus himself taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Open your hearts now to God and receive the blessing. May Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. And let us go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for joining us in worship today, and we're glad that you've been with us on this holy day to celebrate God's grace and love and peace within your lives and our lives and all of our communities of faith. Our closing hymn today is Faith of Our Fathers. Please join us as we sing together our closing hymn, Faith of Our Fathers. Fire 